Welcome to uh, the Life Science Lunch here at the Science Library today. Today we are going to talk about life sciences across disciplines, with a special focus on the innovation that comes out of interdisciplinary work. My name is Alina Meltag and I work as a communications advisor at the Department of Biosciences and I will announce the speakers today. At the Life Science Lunch in March and uh, today, the researchers from five different faculties at UIO have been talking and will be talking about their innovative, uh, innovative life science research. Collaborations across disciplines is essential to succeed for many of the projects. And today we are going to look at uh, some future uh, aspects of medicine and some of the new discoveries, uh, discoveries that are already changing the medical practices today. And the first speaker is Anne Simonsen at the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences at the Faculty of Medicine at UIO. When a cell is not functioning properly or undergoes severe stress, it starts a process of eating itself. It's called autophagy. And it sounds a little bit like a cannibalistic uh, nightmare. But in fact, a better understanding of this process led to the Nobel Prize in Medicine last year. It should also be mentioned that Professor Per Seglen is getting King Olaf's Cancer Research Award this year for his research on the same topic. So I hope that uh, Anne Simonsen will be uh, unraveling some of the mysteries about what this is all about. So please give her a warm applause. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'll just start my timer. Um, so, um, us in a big city, uh, damaged and dysfunctional components will also accumulate in the cell. And the cell actually has a way to deal with this, uh, this damage. And this is then uh, autophagy. And this means self-eating. And it's defined as lysosomal degradation of cytoplasmic material. Uh, and the lysosome is then the cellular uh, garbage handling and recycling uh, plant. Uh, and uh, this is then takes care of uh, getting rid of these damaged and dysfunctional cellular components and uh, re uh, relieves degradation products that can be used for uh, new products and energy. And this happens kind of like in a big city. Cellular components are sequestered by a membrane into a sac or a vesicle called an uh, autophagosome. This autophagosome will then fuse with the lysosome containing the hydrolytic enzymes that will cut up uh, the sequestered material and lead to then a uh, release of degradation products back into the cytosol, and this can be used to generate new products and energy. So, uh, as already mentioned, uh, it's been a very exciting year for autophagy. Uh, it, uh, no, uh, Yoshinori Osumi was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, last year in physiology and medicine for his discoveries of the mechanisms of autophagy. And the Nobel Committee also said that autophagy is recognized as a fundamental process in cell physiology with major implications for human health and disease. And Osumi, actually, he has done research on yeast. So, uh, and this uh, shows the number of uh, papers in PubMed with the keyword autophagy since the first discovery of autophagy by Christian de Duve back in 1963. And he found autophagy as, uh, he, he said that this is a way for, um, for the cell, portions of a cell somehow find their way inside the lysosome and are broken down. And since this, it took several decades before uh, this research field really took off, and our own Per Segel, as also mentioned, did some very uh, important discoveries uh, since 1980 until today, and he's now awarded the uh, King Olaf's uh, Prize for Cancer Research for his discoveries. So, uh, what may really made this field take off was this discovery by Osumi and colleagues of a protein called LC3, and this is a ubiquitin-like small protein, and it is conjugated to these autophagic membranes through the action of uh, ubiquitin-like machinery. So now we have the marker to study this pathway. So you could label these membranes. So this uh, was very important for the study of autophagy. 
both in, uh, in cells and in mammalian in vivo. So uh, through years, we now know that autophagy is not just a bulk uh, pathway for degradation of cytoplasmic components. It can actually be highly selective. So for example, uh, bacteria or virus or damaged organelles as damaged mitochondria or protein aggregates can be specifically recognized and targeted for degradation by autophagy. So um, the first knockout mice were um, uh, were published in 2004-05, where they have depleted, uh, did a full knockout of genes important for autophagy, and found that these mice, they actually die 24 hours after uh, birth, and this is then due to nutrient and energy depletion. So this showed in vivo that autophagy is important, that the degradation of uh, cellular components by autophagy is important for uh, generation of products that can be used through uh, ketogenesis or gluconeogenesis uh, to generate new pro uh, energy and new products. So then, uh, of course, uh, researchers went on to make conditional knockout mice. And for example, a conditional knockout of these two autophagy genes, specifically in the brain, uh, showed that autophagy is important for uh, clearance of protein aggregates and to prevent uh, neurodegeneration. So, these mice have an accumulation of ubiquitin-positive uh, protein aggregates in their neurons, and they die of neurodegeneration. So later, uh, it's been shown through a whole, a lot of studies have shown that autophagy is important basically in all organs of the body, and that uh, dysfunction of autophagy or downregulation or inhibition of autophagy will lead to a whole range of different diseases. So, of course, this is also the reason why the field was awarded with Nobel Prize, that although Osumi did all his work on yeast, later research has shown that autophagy is, the, is important for human health and disease. So, what about my lab? So, uh, this is my current group at the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences. And we, uh, the research focus in my lab is to understand the molecular mechanisms of autophagy. Uh, with a specific focus on lipids and lipid binding proteins uh, involved in this pathway. And of course, to understand the role in, uh, in health and disease. So uh, I don't have time to go into uh, details, just to show you two recent papers where we have focused on trying to understand the lipids and the lipid binding proteins important for uh, formation of these membranes, because we don't really know much about uh, where is the membrane coming from, What's the, um, how is the membrane curvature uh, formed, and what are the lipids and proteins involved in, in the closure of this membrane to form an autophagosome. So we found two proteins, both containing a so-called PX domain that will bind to phosphoenoxidides, and that both these proteins, one called sortinexin-18 and one called HS1BP3, that they act by uh, modulation of recycling endosome membrane. So, sortinexin-18 binds to a lipid called PI45P2, and it can form uh, tubules of these recycling endosome membranes. And then this other protein, HS1BP3, is a negative regulator of autophagy through modulation of phospholipase D1 activity. And we could show that this phosphatidic acid lipid is then important for generation of these recycling endosome-derived autophagosome precursor membranes that provide input to the growing autophagic membrane. We have also been interested in selective autophagy. How can these um, different types of cargo be specifically recognized? And uh, this is showing you one example. This is a protein called ALFI for autophagy-linked 5 protein. This is a protein that is recruited to protein aggregates. So this is a protein aggregate, and uh, alpha is, this, is then important to recruit the autophagic membrane to the uh, aggregate. So alpha will bind to PI3P in the membrane. It also binds to the autophagy machinery in the membrane, as well as to the aggregate itself. So then alpha kind of uh, bridged the uh, aggregate to the membrane. And this is then important for uh, sequestration of the membrane into this autophagosome and further degradation of protein aggregates. 
So, of course, this might be important for neurodegeneration because we know that protein aggregates accumulate in Alzheimer's, Parkinson, uh, Huntington's disease, and so on. So, together with uh, Ayamamoto at the Columbia University, we have addressed the role of this alpha protein in, in vivo using Huntington mice with Huntington's disease. And these mice, they have protein aggregates in their brain and they uh, eventually die because of neuronal cell death. So if we now cross these mice to a mouse lacking alpha in the brain, or a heterozygous form of alpha, uh, things get much worse. So the cells uh, or the mice die sooner due to neurodegeneration, and they have an earlier onset phenotype. So just showing that this alpha protein is also important in vivo. We have also been interested in how this is important for lifespan, and of course, uh, several scientists have contributed to show that autophagy is important for lifespan. So, uh, we, first of all, we know that uh, both from C. elegans, fruit flies and mice, that by age, autophagy levels go down. And we, you might all know that caloric restriction can induce lifespan. So, uh, and this is shown also in all these model organisms to be autophagy dependent. And if we now increased the uh, level of autophagy in fruit flies, and this is also done in mice, we can increase lifespan and reduce the level of protein aggregates. This is just showing you one uh, figure from one of my papers back in, from 2008, where we had fruit flies, either controls, flies with more autophagy or less autophagy. And this shows the percent alive and the days, uh, the uh, lifespan. So the, while the controls have like an average lifespan around 50 days, flies lacking autophagy in the brain, uh, they live much shorter. And flies with more autophagy, they live up to 50% longer than the control flies. So this is super exciting and of course, uh, most hopefully relevant for, for us as well. So we know that the level of autophagy uh, goes down by age. So if we can find a way to increase the level of autophagy, maybe we can live longer and more healthy. So how can we do this? Of course, uh, exercise is known to induce autophagy. Caloric restriction is known to induce autophagy. And the good thing, also resveratrol, that is found in red wine. <laughs> and of course, a high protein, high fat diet will inhibit autophagy. And, of course, there's a lot of drugs uh, that would also stimulate autophagy, and the most uh, famous and um, also approved in the clinic already is rapamycin, that is an inhibitor of the TOR kinase. So, uh, this is my group, and I'm at 11 minutes, so I think I'm quite okay. I would just try, like to thank people involved and funding and collaborators. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Okay. Uh, so I have a couple of questions because um, I'm very fascinated by the fact that cells start eating themselves. Uh, for me, that's uh, something that's uh, like a cannibalism or something. Has it ever happened in your lab that these flies have started um, having too much autophagy? Too much autophagy. So this, of course, you can have conditions where you genetically modify the autophagy machinery or you induce autophagy with drugs. And this uh, too much autophagy can lead to cell death. So it's this balance. It's like a double-edged sword that too little is not good and too much is also not good. And there are diseases associated with too much autophagy. This is muscle dystrophy. So, uh, so of course... So it's not too much like red wine. Everything, it's a balance. I think with red wine you're safe because to get to the dose that will stimulate autophagy is similar to 10 liters a day. Okay. So there might be other <laughs> disadvantages. Uh, but uh, you also said that about the membrane, that you, uh, the membrane is very important in this process. Um, and that you could sort of, maybe the membrane is also targeting uh, what is, is uh, being eaten or, mm -hmm. or destroyed. But... Could, could we make something that would destroy fat tissue, for instance, fat specifically? Tissue. So to destroy, I mean, not destroy fat tissue, but autophagy can also uh, eat lipid droplets. That, of course, would provide or contribute to, to 
growth of uh, adipose cells. So if we induce our autophagy, we would also reduce the fat. But mm. I think specific induction of fat degradation would be uh, difficult. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you very okay. much. Thank and you. it brings some hope to the future. Um, oh. I don't know about coffee, but, uh, but of coffee. Uh, does it induce autophagy or, uh, autophagy I think, or not? Yeah, that's probably a good thing yes. because it <laughs> has antioxidants and yes. that would be good for autophagy. Well, this is a thermo cup from the Life Science Initiative uh, to, uh, to keep your coffee warm and perhaps also keep the autophagy up. Okay, thank you so, <laughs> so much. Thank you, Bart. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, we are going to make a small jump from degeneration to regeneration of tissue. Did you know that bone material is quite a particular material and it's really difficult to reproduce? Professor Håvard Haugen at the Department of Biomaterials at the Institute of Clinical Dentistry at the Faculty of Dentistry has been given a lot of EU grants for developing biomaterials for repair of bone defects. So please welcome uh, Håvard Haugen. First of all, thank you very much for giving this opportunity to uh, talk about science that has been conducted at the uh, Department of uh, Biomaterials. Um, whenever politicians talk about life science, there's always a mantra that comes up, and they always ask, what are we going to do when the oil disappear? What are we going to focus on? And what I'm going to talk about today is another thing that we have in the ground in Norway, and quite a lot of it, and uh, some potential use of that. And that is a mineral called titanium dioxide. And actually, Norway makes 8% of the world production of this mineral. And you can see this mountain here, uh, not too far away from where I'm from, uh, outside Ferda, has 380 million tons of this mineral. So they're going to knock this uh, mountain down and extract this, uh, this material. And even though you might haven't heard about this material, I'm pretty sure that all of the audience actually consume titanium dioxide already today in many products. And why is that? It's because titanium dioxide is widely used as a coloring agent both for uh, paint and paper and in toothpaste. All the medicine that you take has almost 99% uh, paracetamol. Uh, almost any food has titanium dioxide as a colorant, makeup and uh, sunscreen. So we consume a lot of it. It's all around us, everywhere. And uh, the question we asked in our life uh, was, could we do something more useful than the titanium dioxide and just put it into uh, taco mix or M&Ms and Skittles, because these products actually have quite a lot of titanium dioxide in them. Um, so the topic is today, could we use titanium dioxide for life science applications? And that's going to be my talk for today. Um, our hypothesis was to make a porous material out of titanium dioxide and use that to repair bone. And what we need to, re uh, to repair bone, we need a porous material, so cells can creep in from both sides. It needs to be strong because you know that the, uh, the bone carries the whole weight of the body, so it needs to be uh, strong enough. We need to have blood vessels, and it needs to function, uh, function well. And as you all know, that if you break a bone, that is very important after you have a fracture, that the two pieces of bone are really uh, connected to each other. If you have a gap between those bones, that bone will not heal. And of course, there's a lot of clinical applications where you have such a gap. It could be a, due to trauma, it could be an illness you need to take out, uh, it could be a car accident, there's a lot of different applications. And if you have this gap, you need to help the bone with something in, in the middle where the bone cell can grow inside. And the idea then is to apply a porous material, what we call a bone graft or a scaffold, where the bone cell can creep from both sides and facilitate and repair the bone, and then you can up, up walking again. So that's the goal. So how do we make it? It's actually quite simple. If you show this video, it's just a sponge that we take out from the sofa. We put water and titanium dioxide on top of it. We let it dry. Then we heat it up, 
and what we're left is a porous sponge material. The only problem is that these materials are very brittle. So if you try to put those kind of materials into a bone, of course it will break. And then uh, in a series of studies that are conducted in our lab, we find out that if we sinter, so we heat it up at a particular speed and a time, we are able to make these long, thin struts that you saw very strong. And what we managed to do then is to make a very porous material that is uh, also very strong. And we managed to get it very close to the mechanical strength of uh, trabecular bone. And here you can see that there are pores from, from all sides, and it's of course very important when the bone cells are creeping in from all sides, that all these holes have in interconnections and they can grow in from all sides. If, if you had very small pores and very small connections, you were not able to fill these materials with, uh, with new bone. Oh, yeah, and I just to warn you as well, I know this is a lunch uh, seminar, and if you haven't eaten your lunch, then please eat your lunch, because there are going to be some bloody pictures coming up in a, uh, in a few moments. We went then and tested in how the bone cells like this, and they love this material. So even though it's a material that we naturally don't have in our body, that we, but we consume it uh, on, a, on a daily basis, the bone cells loves it. So these are bone cells attached to this scaffold, and they uh, adhere extremely well to the material, they pr proliferate, and they start uh, joining up. So the cells loves it. Then we thought, okay, if the cells uh, loves it, how does it do when we try to put it into uh, an animal? Because before we can put a material into a human uh, body, we need to do a series of tests to make sure that it's safe and that it's function. So the first thing we did was just to put it into um, a rabbit tibia, where we, had, uh, we made some small holes, and we put a titanium screw on top to make sure that materials didn't uh, fall out. And then with a the micro CT, we measure how much bone uh, it came in here compared to the, uh, the hole that there were no materials inside. And what we saw, it was a lot of bone where the titanium dioxide was present, and a lot more than the uh, hole itself. And we also measured the, um, uh, how well the body, uh, how well the rabbits accepted the material, and there were no inflammation and there was no uh, toxic effects um, on the material. And you can see again here, maybe the light is not perfect, but you can clearly see that the bone has started to grow into this uh, material. Uh, and this is just uh, histology, histology, just to show that the, my micro CT, that what you see here is actually a uh, new form bone, and it's not just an artifact from my micro CT scans. Then we went on to a bigger model. We put it into a uh, mini pig jaws. We extracted the, the premolars, and we put this scaffold material uh, inside these holes, and then we looked what happened. And here you can see a uh, micro CT image again. Here's the, uh, the tooth left. Here's an empty uh, sham where no material was placed. And here is the, uh, the titanium dioxide porous material. And you can see there's a lot of bone. It might be easy to see in the next picture. Here's an x-ray picture. And here is a histology image. The white or the yellowish part, this is the, um, the titanium dioxide. And the purple color, that's newly formed bone. And what is quite remarkable that you don't really see with this material is that the whole space is filled with new bone. Usually you have a lot of bone around the material, but you have actually a lot of bone inside. And I also said it was very important to have a lot of blood vessels uh, inside as well. And if you look closely, there's a lot of blood vessels formation inside the new bone, and that's very important, because if you want to heal a big defect and you get a lot of new bone, then that bone will not survive if there's not enough blood vessels transporting nutrients in and waste products out. So we solved the thing with the vascularization, we solved it also with, uh, with the strength and the uh, porosity, And then we went on to a, uh, a third animal study, and this is we did a lot more challenging model. And here we placed the materials on the buccal side uh, of the jaw, so we removed, made this defect, 
uh, and then we placed the scaffold materials with a screw and uh, see if it would survive um, a similar kind of uh, situation. It's a very ch challenging model. And what we saw is that the material integrated also here extremely well. I know I don't have much time left, so I go quickly to the to the last slide. And this is the the fourth animal study that we did on uh, on a dog study. And again, we did a very challenging model with a dental implant and the um, and the materials um, with the bone ridge, and the uh, material function extremely well. So, conclude with my talk. We managed to make a very porous materials out of a material that is very abundant uh, in Norway. We got a very high strength, and we got a lot of vascularizations inside, we got a lot of new bone. And this was a concept that was originated from uh, biomaterials, and we managed to get it from idea to patent, and uh, now we even have the C approval, so we're allowed to put it into patient. So, an officer of life science said that health in innovation should be covered, and I think this is a good example of where both health and innovation has come together. And this C approval was done in collaboration with a company, Corticalis. And then just come to acknowledgement, we got a lot of grants to do these studies, a lot of partners. So uh, thank you for everyone that contributed, because I did not do this by myself. There was a lot of people helping out in the process. Thank you. So. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I just, uh, I can't help myself, but I, ha I have to ask. Yes. Is it possible to sort of grow yourself an, an extra leg or extra bones or uh, what I would call spare ribs? <laughs> <laughs> I think, that, I mean, you definitely have a potential of spare parts. Because uh, now there's a big drive that everybody wants to live longer and uh, be more healthier. Maybe 20 years ago, um, somebody with a 6 years old would be fine with a, with a knee that it was not working. But now the 70-year-old and 8-year-old, they still want to go to Birken and they still want to do downhill uh, slalom. So there's a big push in the market that push for uh, having spare parts that function. So that's why there's a, a lot of new products and a lot of innovation that comes in to replace almost any part of the uh, human body. But if, is there any chance that these uh, these spare parts then, that can be grown, that they can be better that, uh, than our natural tissue? I think that's quite challenging because the nature has done evolution in so many thousands of years and just spending then 10 years in research in the lab, so the beating evolution for many, many thousand years, I mean, that's, that's quite a challenge. But, but it's still nice to have some yes, spare parts exactly, for uh, exactly. growing old. Um, as a small token of our gratitude, there's a thermocup for keeping your coffee warm. So I hope you drink coffee. Yes. Thank you very much Thank for you. your presentation. Thank you. So we have come to our last presentation. And uh, from the very powerful tool of growing bone tissue, we will make a jump to another powerful tool, which is mathematics. So uh, in uh, this research, it's, uh, it's about creating models of reality. And this has become increasingly useful, and particularly in biomedical research, where modeling can save a lot of work and, uh, and also time and money. So postdoctoral fellow Alvaro Kern Lugui uh, um, at the Institute of Basic Medical Sciences at the Faculty of Medicine and also a member of the Center of Research-Based Innovation, Big Insight. He will give us an idea about what uh, is the power of maths. So please welcome um, Alvaro Kern Lugui. invitation to speak here. Um, I would like to start this talk with a very strong sentence. If you want a career in medicine these days, you're better off studying mathematics of, or computing than biology. That's quite strong, right? It's actually not my sentence. It's a sentence of, a, of an authority in medicine, of uh, Sir Rory Collins, head of a clinical trial unit, professor of medicine at the University of Oxford. And there are uh, more and more experts, both in uh, medicine and biology, sharing this view. So the question is, why mathematics and computing seem to be so important now to understand 
uh, biology to improve medicine. A related question is uh, why we have to, I think, quite urgently change the way we are teaching biology and medicine. So the first thing I will say is that um, this is not new. As many people have used math and computing before. Here I show you some of the pioneers, uh, like Daniel Bernoulli, Leonard Euler, Darcy Thompson, Ronald Fisher, Turing, Hans Meinhardt. Uh, really distinguished names. I could speak for hours about each of them. But here I will just say a couple of brief, very things about, um, uh, as a sort of uh, a tribute to Darcy Thompson and Hans Meinhardt. So Darcy Thompson wrote this book here on growth and form, 1917, um, which is considered a hallmark in mathematical biology. And this year, 100 years after, we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of that book. That's why I had this beautiful uh, seashell of an Itilus with a spiral shape in the, in the first light. The other tribute is to Hans Meinhardt, a person that I uh, truly um, appreciate and that uh, sadly passed away last year. He uh, was a real pioneer in the use of mathematical models and computer simulations to understand basic principles and to understand uh, mechanisms of biology. And uh, he was actually the, the, um, the, one of the referees of my PhD thesis. I had the opportunity to, to be with him many times. And one of the things he told me is that he had really hard times to publish his works in biological journals. He was working in a Max Planck Institute of Biology, Developmental Biology, and it was for him very hard to publish. His works are brilliant. I recommend everyone to read their books, his books, because this will open your mind. And um, so what has changed now? Like uh, people is saying we need to know a lot of mathematics and biology, but uh, in the 80s, in the, even in the 90s, it was really hard. So what has changed? One thing is biological complexity. It's not that biological complexity has changed since the 80s or the 90s, but the more we know about biology, the more uh, we know how complicated it is. And, um, and uh, also we are starting to address more and more complex things in biology, such as the functioning of the brain, such as all the molecular things that happen inside cells. Let's have a quick look uh, to some numbers to have an idea of the complexity we're talking about. In one cell, we have 300 million molecules, approximately. That's an incredible number. It just is only one cell. One human has about 10 trillion cells in the body of different types, and they are continuously interacting. That's another source of complexity. It's not just a collection of many things. It's that this highly dynamic. The molecules are interacting all the time, they are being changing, they are being regulated, they are being formed, and this makes cells to uh, migrate, to divide, to die, to differentiate. So it's really dynamic. But there's some order, some structure there. And uh, I think this uh, beautiful masterpiece of Salvador Dali represents this uh, structure in a very dynamic thing. Um, there's another source of complexity which is that biology is multiscale. There are many scales involved. We have things that happen at the molecular level, all the genomics, all the proteins, and so on. We have things that happen at the cellular level, communication between cells, and many cells form tissues and organs, and many organs form humans, and when you put a lot of humans, you have populations. So there are many scales, spatial scales. And uh, the time at where, where things happen here and things happen here are also very different. Things happen here very fast, things happen here a little bit slower. So, and and all, the, all the scales are interacting all the time. Something that happens here will, uh, at the molecular level, you change some proteins and the proteins will make changes in the cells and the cells will make changes in the organs. There's also interaction from here to here. So you have a force, for instance, acting on a tissue. This will make some changes in some expression of some uh, molecules, and this will make changes. So the, all this multi-scale interaction and these feedbacks makes things even more difficult to understand. It's one of the most challenging things in biology. What maths have to say about this? What can we do with maths? First thing is 
to remember that math is the most, most advanced and precise language to deal with complexity, as um, it's been shown in other fields like physics, engineering. Um, in mathematics, we have a toolkit of many tools to study actually dynamic and multi-scale processes. Uh, some of these tools we call mathematical models. That's what I uh, work, what I do. And some of these models are applied to biology, some of them very successful to describe biological processes. Um, we use them to test biological hypotheses. Uh, we also make predictions with them that later can be compared with experimental data. And one of the um, things that our, uh, models can do, it's very challenging, but models can bridge scales. So you, here you see the type of data that you can collect for all these uh, different scales, examples of data. You can collect genomic data, you can collect like cellular data, you can collect medical imaging, for instance. And mathematical models uh, can be used to bridge this different data, which it's very difficult to do without mathematics. Another challenging thing, all these data that we are collecting in biology are growing, are exploding. Here's just some number. Um, only the genomic data, just a li very little part of it. In 2025, um, it's, it's expected that it will grow faster than the data that are collected nowadays in YouTube or Twitter, for instance. This is incredible. We're talking about exabytes. This is data that fill full buildings with servers in 2025. Fortunately, we have big machines. Uh, it's not only to store data, but to analyze them, to, to process them. Otherwise, we, we will not understand anything what is happening. Um, so we can now make calculations that were not possible before. We can make now uh, use algorithms that were not possible to run before. We can make simulations, as I do, uh, that was not possible before. Um, I don't know if you know this building, but this building is a uh, it's, uh, supercomputing center in Barcelona. It's inside a church. So you know in, in Spain we have so many churches and number of... Uh, Catholic people is decreasing. So we have now, uh, uh, we can use them for a better goal, I would say. So uh, this approach, mathematics and computing, um, computational modeling, what I do, it's used in every field of biology nowadays. And uh, I want to show you in this uh, few minutes I have to show you just one example of what we are doing here. Um, on personalized medicine, which is selecting the, um, the best therapy, taking individual variability into account. And uh, this is very challenging and very necessary in cancer. So every person is different, every cancer is different. We need to treat every person differently, but we don't know how to do it. Our solution is to run computer simulations. That The idea is that we, we will be able to predict what is the effect of a therapy in a patient. And the way we do it is in breast cancer, we collect data of different types. We have molecular data, histology, that you can see individual cells, you can see at the tissue level with uh, medical imaging. And we have built a model, a multi-scale model, that bridges all these levels of uh, data and that explains how uh, therapy will affect a piece of the tumor in that patient. Then we run computer simulations, and um, what we can do now is, with patients that we know what happened, we can reproduce what has happened in that patient, and then we can test what will have happened if we have tried different therapies. We can run many different uh, therapeutic strategies, different dosage, different schedules, and uh, that's what we're doing now. Our goal, sorry, it's to be able to do this overnight, simulate thousands of, uh, of uh, strategies and uh, to tell the oncologist next day, look, we have tried all these drugs, we have simulated all these doses, all these schedules, and uh, this is 
the three ones that work better. And uh, uh, oncologists will be able to select then what is the optimal treatment plan that hopefully will uh, Im improve uh, the life of this patient or hopefully cure them. Just uh, I finish with a few slides showing some simulations of this. So this is a real part of a tissue. We do simulations in 2D. And here, pathologists have identified where the cells are, where the blood vessels are. Our model uh, describes how the drugs go out of these, um, of these uh, vessels, uh, how much oxygen is in the tissue. Uh, this all we describe with mathematics. And uh, then the cells will die, the cells will divide, and so on. So here is one simulation. Black is cancer cells, white is uh, normal cells, and, uh, and in red you see here the oxygen. We simulate many other molecules. We simulate the drugs, we simulate other molecules that are important for the specific therapy here. Here it's a combination of uh, chemotherapies and antiangiogenic therapy that is applied. And here we reproduce actually what the patient uh, had. This is a real situation. The, the, the therapy didn't work. Um, and our model reproduced it. We simulate small pieces of a tumor, but we do this with a lot of them. And all of them, uh, the therapy does not work. Then we are quite happy about the model. And then we are starting to try alternative therapies. We try many of them. And we have found one which is actually using the same drug, but in a different dosage, in a different schedule, which uh, will work, which will kill two more cells in a few weeks. So. Uh, that's what we are doing here at University of Oslo. Uh, we want to test this with many more patients. We want to, um, to stimulate bigger parts of the tumor to make things more, even more realistic. And uh, I think that this kind of uh, mathematical and computational modeling approach will play a key role in the future of personalized medicine. And um, just I finished last sentence. Um, I think that doctors in the future will be deciding what algorithm is better, not what therapy, what simulation is better. So that's why they really need to understand this. They really need to learn mathematics and computing to be able to decide this. And uh, they should actually be able to develop these tools with us. So that's why we need to change the way we teach mathematics and biology and, uh, sorry, biology and medicine using mathematics and, and computer science. Um, thanks to my collaborators, Arnoldo Frigesi and Sharon Lay, especially in the, the Department of Biostatistics and uh, my funding, uh, European Union co-fund program, but, uh, Science Fellows and Big Insight Center for Research-Based Innovation funded by Norwegian Research Council. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I'm just wondering, with this very high level of complexity, how is it possible to, to make a model that actually shows the reality? I was just so taken aback by the, the level of complexity here. Yeah, so um, I can, I can, so we, we try to reproduce um, um, uh, things in reality. Um, this is happening also in, in many other fields. For instance, I will make an analogy which you will understand very well uh, with something that you use every day, which is weather forecast. Weather forecast is uh, done with mathematical models and simulations in the same way we are doing forecasts of therapies. And uh, they reproduce in these models how uh, the atmosphere moves, and uh, these laws are very well known. So the predictions are quite well, or at least reasonably well for what we need. We will be between 15 and 20 degrees tomorrow. That's enough. That's good. I um, hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, um, in, in our uh, case, we don't know the laws of biology so well. So mm -hmm. our models are still not so precise. And uh, our predictions are still not so precise. But we will get there. I think, yes. hopefully. <laughs> I hope so too. Um, as a token of our gratitude, there is a thermocup mm -hmm. to keep the coffee warm. I hope mathematicians also drink coffee. So thank, thank you, you very, much. very much and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. 
So this was uh, the last science, life science lunch for uh, this semester, but uh, there is an academic Nashville in May, 12th of May, um, uh, at the, the University of Oslo. And uh, we will be talking about inception of uh, false memories. Um, that's one of the topics. So I hope uh, to see all of you the 12th of May. Thank you very much.